Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. So I'm with the Sadlak. I work with Aerodynamics, and I will show you a presentation about what we did with speed skiers in Aerodynamics. Obviously, this is something that you can do on lots of different objects. You could do it on cars, motorcycles, airplanes, whatever you want. So a lot of this workflow is quite similar to what you would do in other situations. And the focus of this presentation will be more on sending in proper geometries into these things and have a very broad ability to modify those. So it's not so much focus on visualizations, because if you make nice pictures, it's nice. It's good to show for managers, but it doesn't make the skier go any faster. So jumping to the next slide, just a little bit of acknowledgments. The Swedish speed ski team was involved in this, so they helped out with a lot of the inputs and so on. My friends and colleagues over at Volvo Cars uh, that I work with were helping out also with the wind tunnel testing and gave some inputs on my calculations and so on. And then, of course, uh, Svenska Spel sponsored the Swedish speed ski team. So just to give you an idea of what speed ski actually is, you go to the steepest slope you can find, and you go straight down and try to go as fast as possible. The world record is 255.5 kilometers an hour, and here you can see Britta Backlund, Swedish skier. She broke the Swedish record for women with 244.9 kilometers an hour. So it's quite fast, quite dangerous, but for this reason, when they want to try out new things, they usually come to a wind tunnel to do a lot of these testings. And this is a video short from the Volvo car wind tunnel where they were visiting and they tested out their equipment. And uh, as we see, you have some smoke visualization as well. And since we're in this picture, we can also go through the equipment a little bit so you get an idea what it differs from normal ski discipline. They have specialized helmets. Uh, they are limited to its size, but they can, other than that, do quite a lot with the shaping of them. So they can uh, figure out a way how to make them more aerodynamic, if they know how. And then also the fairings, they put these fairings on their legs to make the legs more aerodynamic. And then, of course, they also have ski poles that are bent in a special way, so for hopefully it will help them to hold the position, but also to make it slim and more aerodynamic. And when they're in the wind tunnel, they're actually standing on a rig like this that is connected to struts into the floor. They're connected to a scale or a balance that is measuring all the forces that are happening. So you get a readout of what the forces are. And you can also do some smoke visualization as well. So you can blow some uh, yeah, smoke and see where, what is happening with, with that if you have flow separations and so on. And this is where I come in the picture because I work with aerodynamics. I do a lot of CFD simulations and I also do wind tunnel testing. So I pitched them an idea. OK, since you're doing already the wind tunnel testing, would it be interesting for you to also do some CFD? And that kind of makes sense, because then you can really try out your different configurations on your helmets, on your fairings, on the legs, and so on, and also positions. And uh, I've worked with aerodynamics for over 10 years. Uh, I'm actually a former skier when I was a kid, before I quit. So I did slalom, giant slalom, super G, and all these things when I was a kid. And I also have interest in 3D modeling and arts and sports, of course. So. A little bit of introduction, and here we show you some forces and equations. And this is quite important to do before you start doing simulations, to know what kind of a forces and what kind of things you actually should be expecting. Or if your simulation is completely wrong, then you will at least know that something is up. So it's good to know, do these type of things in the beginning. So you have the force that is driving you forward, and that's the mass times gravity, times the sinus of the slope angle. So of course, if the slope is completely flat, you don't move forward. But if it's very steep, you move, of course, faster. Up until it's 90 degrees, then you have basically free fall. And these forces are a little bit balanced by the friction and the aerodynamic drag. And just to give you a short <coughs> idea of what these drag values are, it's because uh, drag will increase, the aerodynamic drag will increase with the speed in, in the square. So, here you can see that you have half the density times velocity squared times CDA. CDA can be also split up, but you can actually use it as one term, which I think is better in this case, uh, that you have the coefficient of drag times frontal area. 
But for skiers, it's a little bit tricky to calculate the frontal area because as soon as they change the position, they're also changing the frontal area. So then you have to keep track of two different parameters, which doesn't make so much sense. So it's better to keep it in one parameter completely. And in this case, it feels quite simple. Why not just put equal sign between them and then just balance them out and see, okay, if I have a certain CDA value, what will be my velocity? But the problem is, if you're on a ski slope, the first portion of the ski slope is super steep. So we accelerate like crazy. And then when they're actually measuring the speed, it's in a flatter portion of the slope where you actually might even be deaccelerating. So it's very difficult to just do generalized relation between these two. So we have to solve it for the whole system. And that makes you kind of go to differential equations. Just to mention, you also create some lift forces and you have some normal forces against the slope. So, but you can ignore them in this case. But it's actually quite easy since you can just create a relation between the distance, the velocity and acceleration. The distance we know, that's the ski slope. Velocity we want to know and force or the acceleration and the forces is what we can actually solve. So you put it in a system like this and you can solve it. But we have a problem here. We don't know the slope, the ski slope, the angles. So here Blender can actually help you out. You get the Blender GIS plugin. You go to the ski slope where they broke all the records. You get the data for the heights, the satellite pictures, and now you can plot out your track. And then you go back into Blender you can go into your Python folder, you can install SciPy, Matplotlib, and now you have a beautiful workspace in Blender where you can use the BPIs for all the geometry, you can use the differential equations in solvers, differential equation solver in SciPy, and then you can plot it with Matplotlib. So perfectly nice. And from this you can get some kind of understanding what is actually happening. So for different CDA values, you will see you will get different top velocities. And here you can actually start to understand what would be the rules of thumb for this. So for here, in this case, say that you have 10 counts a decrease of your CDA, that will give you 7 kilometers per hour extra. But the interesting thing is also if you gain weight, you can also say that you gained 10, 10 kilograms, you go 4 kilometers extra. So if you have a big breakfast, maybe that will help you break the record. So it's good things to keep in mind. And also you can split up the forces and you actually can see the aerodynamic drag, the friction and the force that is driving you forward. So in the steep section, you build up lots of speed and lots of forces actually acting on you. So you're accelerating tremendously, but then you lose everything as soon as the slope starts flattening out. So here you have to really keep your position and do your absolute best to keep it, keep up with it. And here we'll talk a little bit about the procedures that I use to start uh, doing these calculations. And you can start by taking the pictures of the skier using Meshroom to do uh, photonometry of it. And then use Blender to do lots of the other geometry stuff. And then use uh, professional open, uh, open source solvers like OpenFoam, which is perfect for fluid mechanics like this. And then when you're done with that, you can visualize a lot of that in Paraview. After that, I usually like to take all that stuff back into Blender to get an understanding of what I should be improving for the next run. And I think this whole system, it is fully open source and it works perfectly well. And uh, you can easily run it on any Linux distribution, I think, so it's really nice. Then I also should mention that Krita and VX Maxima are also really good tools, also open source and available. So, starting with the 3D scanning, this one is a really bit tricky, especially if you just have one camera to go around to take all the pictures, and the skiers tries to stand in this position perfectly still. They normally only stand for 20 seconds when they ski like this, and as I'm walking around there taking this picture, it takes about two and a half minutes. And then this guy was also wearing a full face helmet, so he didn't get much oxygen, so he was very dizzy afterwards. But we still made it, but what I, I would also like to show you that there's a little bit of a trick that you can do in a mesh room, is that you can export all the cameras, camera positions. Because it can, even if it has some trouble to get the geometry of the skier, it can still track the background. So it knows where the different pictures were taken, you can understore the pictures, and with some scripting you can drop it into Blender, and you can jump between different cameras and use it as a stencil to modify your skier or whatever you, that you work on, especially those areas that it, the 3D software didn't capture really well. 
So that I think is very useful. And then you do, of course, with topology because you want to have subdivided mesh in the end so that you can really crank up the subdivisions before you send it for your simulation. And then, of course, since it's a skier, it's good to rigify it as well. So you can do just a simple rig with some inverse kinematics, like in this case. You have Blender asset library, so you can store all the different configurations and poses that you have. You can blend in between them, so you don't have to create everything. For example, if they're interested in shoulders out and shoulders in, you can blend between those. You can freehand to move skis if you want a wider position. You can have a pole bone for the knees, so you can push in the knees if you want to. And you can do the same things for the elbows and arms. Like this. And now we can go over to the next one. And here you can see the subdivisions. So you try to create a clean mesh like this. Obviously, a mesh like this would not be enough for doing CFD simulations. You have to really crank it up. It should be smaller than maybe one millimeter in size per cell. But the nice thing is you can build it like this, and then you can crank up the subdivision as much as you want. And here you can see it's also if you use uh, bevel modifiers and these type of things, you can really create those corners without creating insane amount of loop cuts and stuff like that. And also mirroring, of course. Uh, and then when you're done with your model, you can easily just crank up the subdivision, send it into uh, Snappy Hex Mesh. And uh, maybe I need to explain a little bit how this actually works, because what these programs, these CFD solvers, what they actually do, they build the fluid domain with smaller, small cells. And it's those cells, it solves for pressure and velocity, mainly. So that's how you sort of have to do and you maybe get 100 million cells in your domain, which is quite a lot. You need at least about 150 gigabytes of RAM to run this thing. But still, I think it's manageable. I'm sure a lot of you have good Blender workstations. So it could be possible to run it there. Usually a run of this type, full simulation, will maybe take you about uh, eight hours or something like that. So it's still kind of manageable. Maybe if it takes twice as long, it's still manageable. But it depends also what kind of a uh, turbulence models you use. You can use turbulence models that will take you years to complete or just weeks. So it depends. You have to find a way how to balance out all this. So yeah, we can move on to next slide. And these are the results that you will get in Paraview. And this is line integral convolution. So this shows you the vectors, how the flow is going around the, the surfaces. As you can see, especially in the front of the helmet, you have the stagnation point. Uh, the, the blue color means that you have almost zero velocity in that area. So from that point, you see that you, you have these vectors going out around the helmet. So you can sort of see what path the air will take. And behind the helmet, you can also see you have a big separation zone. So that is something maybe one can focus on to improve the drag on this skier. Then you have also a CP tot plot down below, which shows all, you, all the problem areas that you might have. And these are the areas where you have high vorticity. You, of course, want to eliminate those, since you want to have like an airfoil, complete smooth transition and separation as you go. And then you will get some results. In this case, 0 0.08 CDA. And you're thinking, like, OK, maybe this is a good thing or a bad thing. You don't know yet. But then you compare it with the wind tunnel test, and you see that they have a force of 232 newtons, which translates to 0 0.14. And you're thinking, whoa, why is this twice as much? And then you realize they're actually standing on this rig, and this rig is inside the flow field. So it generates drag. So the easy thing is to just test it in Blender again, just build the rig very quickly, it takes more time to ask somebody to send you the CAD files than to just build it in 10 minutes and send it for a simulation. And then all of a sudden, you know, OK, how does it compare with the wind tunnel test? Oh, now you see they're quite close, actually. They're around 10%. And uh, you can also consider that the skier and in both pictures are a little bit different. They're in little different positions. So it's actually quite accurate. But the beauty is how when you have a software that is easy to use and you can create geometry very quickly, then you became more proactive to figure out the problems yourself instead of hoping that somebody will send you a geometry at some point and maybe you look it up. So that, I think, is very nice. And then when uh, you have your results, you can also put it back into Blender to, to understand what you want to do in the future. You can see all these problem areas. 
and then go and focus on one of them. And since you can overlay everything, it's much easier to understand what do you actually want to change in this case. So you don't have to overdo it and uh, push it down too much and then try to go back. You can sort of see, okay, this streamlines are probably going to go like this. And you can sort of use your imagination sort of what you would like to change. Obviously, tricky thing with aerodynamics is that a lot of these problems are not local, but they affect each other down the line. So say that I improve this area, maybe I will have other separation points further down on the back of the skier. Maybe I will have different downwash because of that. So maybe I have to do five other things just to get all the potentials from this little improvement that I've done in one place. So that, I think, is one of the trickiest things in aerodynamics. That's why you have to run so many different simulations. And then when you're done with your stuff, then you probably want to put it in a report like this to show the people that you work with what, what you actually have done. And you can see you, this is a, basically a study on, for example, where the elbows or if you should they have the hands closer to, to the helmet. And then you can keep doing lots of other things as well, looking into what to improve. So for the future endeavors, still a lot to do with CFD, wind tunnel, and real world testing, because everything has to also work in the real world. So you can maybe use tufts and other things just to see how things will work and turn out in the end. And then uh, they're actually implementing some of the findings already. So we'll see this winter what, what is actually working and what isn't. And then uh, for the future, of course, even better quality, maybe find a different way to do this uh, 3D scanning, perhaps. Could be very interesting. And also see if one can extract more information, because you can also, in the CFD especially, you can isolate different areas. You can, for example, just look at what are the forces that are acting on the helmet. Do I create some moments? Do I have any other issues with that? And then, of course, when you feel like you understand all of this, you can run your optimizations and improve it further and let the computer find the optimum with some algorithms. So thank you.